Thank you for signing in and joining us today. And uh, and uh, this webinar is a discussion of exceptional homes for exceptional people. And I hope that we pique your interest and discuss a few things that I think haven't been um, understood that well or uh, perhaps not known. And um, and for any questions beyond this, uh, for sure, get a hold of us and, and let us know. Uh, we'd enjoy having uh, those conversations with you. My name is Ty Newell, and I'm coming from this house that you see on the front. This is uh, my house, uh, basically a 2,100 square foot ranch. It's a zero plus home that is powered by an eight and a half kilowatt solar array and back. It's the first house to harvest rainwater and be allowed to use rainwater in indoors um, within a municipality within Illinois. Of course, we've been collecting rainwater for millennia. But um, and in the garage, you see two electric vehicles: um, uh, a Ford Focus that we acquired in 2012, and a plug-in C Max. And we're looking forward to our next uh, electric vehicle that will make us fully electric. Um, on that front, so uh, we're we're driven toward sustainable, comfortable, and healthy living, and uh, and the technologies and solutions that we need for doing that. Um, my uh, business partners are Ben Newell and Alex Long, two younger fellows, um, and we're here in Urbana, Illinois, about two to three hours south of Chicago. And our company, Build Equinox, as uh, you may already know, uh, developed and, and manufactures a smart ventilation system we call the SERV, and now in its second generation form, the SERV 2. And we're proud that our business is also a net zero business facility, 4,500 square foot Morton building that's Powered also by um, about 800, uh, eight, eight, um, eight and a half kilowatts of solar between the uh, 3.2 uh, kilowatt tracking array you see behind us in this picture and then another uh, five, 5.3 uh, kilowatt stationary array uh, built off of our building. I just wanted to mention in this day and age as uh, the coronavirus and the COVID-19 infection that's uh, spreading throughout the world rapidly. Uh, we wrote a recent article, and if you haven't seen it, uh, the newsletter on our site discusses um, uh, different aspects of disease transmission in general, as well as uh, respiratory diseases. And the key goal, of course, is to avoid getting sick yourself, as well as uh, creating conditions that reduce the propagation, the self-propagation and the sustained propagation of the disease throughout a community as well as throughout the world. And if you haven't seen that article, um, uh, take a look, and I hope there's some things of value to help you understand why what is now called social distancing, but why that is so important. Ideally, if we put ourselves individually into quarantine for a two to three week period, we would snuff this thing out. Unfortunately, the practical reality is that uh, some interactions needed among people and, um, and hopefully the more that can be minimized to just the essentials, the quicker uh, and then the more beneficially we can reduce this. But in any case, um, please take a look at that and then watch for an upcoming webinar that um, that we will hold in another week or so to, um, to update people on uh, COVID-19 as well as uh, ideas related to creating a healthy indoor space. Um, uh, and ventilation is a very, very key part of that. Today, we're mainly discussing a couple of features that we consider essential for designing and constructing an exceptional home. And just to give you a couple ideas of 
couple exceptional homes. This top one is a home that is in Morocco, and it was part of the recent solar decathlon competition held in Morocco. And um, uh, the winning team, one of the universities involved with that was Colorado School of Mines. And, um, and we're very pleased to have been part of that project. Uh, it's our first serve smart ventilation system located in Africa. And we're very pleased, especially that uh, the teams just did a wonderful job and they won the competition. Uh, uh, anybody that's been involved with the solar decathlon knows what an exhausting and what a tremendous amount of effort goes into uh, the competition, uh, both for the students and faculty involved, as well as for um, the people who organize the competition. And then down below is a, a wonderful home created by Tom Bassett Dilly and Associates. Tom is an architect located in Oak Park, also the home of uh, the former home of Frank Lloyd Wright. And Tom carries on that excellence in architecture uh, tradition. And his Acorn Glade home recently won the Best Single Family and Source Zero Project Award at the recent North American Passive House Conference in, by Washington, D.C. And here's a few other homes that are also examples of exceptional homes. Um, this one in Illinois, also a Tom Bassett Billy called Foursquare. Um, and um, that home, uh, along with this one in Colorado, along with the South Carolina and the one in Florida, uh, these are all uh, passive house designed homes. The first passive house in Denver, uh, first passive house in South Carolina, and first in Florida. And we're very pleased to be part of these exceptional homes. And you can see quite a variety of architectural styles. The architectural style and the performance of a home uh, from our 4,500 square foot Morton building, typical steel-sided agricultural building that's the home of Build Equinox which as I mentioned is net zero along with these wonderful homes. Um, the, the style isn't so important. You can have the look, the features, the, the uh, type of building or home that you want and still have it as an exceptional building. And then this Vermont home um, constructed by Vermont, uh, which I recommend you go to their site and read about their homes. They've been building Vermont modular homes since about 2013, when we first brought the serve on the market, and we're very uh, pleased and proud to be part of these homes, which are um, exceptional homes. You can use a single module as shown in this picture or combine modules together. Um, and uh, these homes from very detailed study we've conducted, and we'll look at some of that data, but they exceed uh, passive house standards, both FIAS, the North American uh, passive house group, as well as the European passive house standards by a good 20%. And um, the thing that's in common with these, it makes them exceptional from our view. They all feature smart ventilation, serve um, uh, first generation serve smart ventilation, as well as now the second generation that came out about two years ago. And their comfort conditioning is uh, very efficient. And in the case of all of these homes, uh, they're all uh, today's low temperature, high efficiency, mini split heat pumps, air source heat pumps. Although we're in many homes with uh, geothermal heat pumps as well. So the combination of today's high performance heat pumps and smart ventilation equals uh, healthy, comfortable, and satisfied occupants because they can move their house around in comfort, move their house around in air quality as they wish. So we're gonna start with the answers and then we'll go through some of the background on it. So to us, an exceptional house needs about 300 CFM of airflow capability for its fresh air ventilation system 
we uh, feel that 50 CFM per occupant is the level of airflow and figuring homes up to about six occupants for about 300 CFM uh, cubic feet per minute of airflow, that this is a level that will satisfy most everybody. What we call three sigma or three standard deviations of variation around what average preference for air quality would be. And uh, three sigma means that basically 99.7% of the populace would be able to find air quality that satisfies them within that. And, uh, and this is an important distinction because today's ventilation standards, which are inadequate in several, uh, in, in several manners, from overventilating when no one's there to underventilating, when people are there, that uh, by being able to um, provide the airflow and allow occupants to set it where they would like it, that this reduces callbacks. Current ventilation standards are nominally based on 20% of the general populace being dissatisfied with air quality. And that doesn't mean the other 80% are satisfied. It means that there's a large fraction in there that are okay with it. And so to us, this is just isn't acceptable. Let's make it so somebody can have the air quality that they would prefer. Second, each of these homes that I just showed have at least one ton of heating cooling capacity. And the other thing we've found from field research that we'll discuss is that an exceptional house should have approximately one ton of heating cooling capacity regardless of the climate that that house is in. That is, it could be 70 degrees outside, perfect weather, and still the occupants of the home may like to move it from one temperature to another, one humidity to another, and it's this transient movement of a home's mass from one comfort condition to another that requires a certain amount of capacity. We'll talk a little bit about why that's been buried within design uh, methods for, for home design. And we'll also show data that, that indicates that this is true. But basically, if you do supply a minimum or, or or understand that a minimum heating cooling capacity is about one ton, that means about 99.7% of the populace, or about three sigma, will be, uh, will be satisfied. And again, reducing callbacks if you're uh, designing a home or building a home. And finally, just a, a last comment that we'll add at the end of this talk, is that if one ton of capacity is good, maybe consider adding two tons of comfort capacity. Even though on average you may only need a half a ton to a ton as your design day heating cooling capacity, nominally 12,000 BTUs per hour, with today's inverter drive mini split heat pumps, if you add two individual one ton heat pump, you'll find that operating those at part load results in up to 30% more efficiency with the basic idea that uh, two independent one-ton mini splits, each running at half capacity, operate 30% more efficient than a one-ton mini split heat pump operating at full capacity. I think something that goes against the grain of um, uh, common wisdom thinking that when with the old bang bang type operation of furnaces and air conditioners that overcapacity was bad that's not true with today's inverter drive systems and so I'll show you some data on that average design versus three sigma design average design is what most of us have used from things like rem rate phpp or other types of models our zeros model uh, which is free to use and, and accessible online. 
Um, similarly is an average design, meaning that we take an average representative day of each month of the year. And then we do primarily a climate-based um, climate based determination of how much heating and cooling capacity is required. But also buried in these typically is something called a design day calculation that takes a day which often is based on it being about 99.6% of the time that the weather will not get worse than that, that it will not get colder than that in the winter or warmer than that in the summer. And basically, this is extending average weather data out to about three sigma, uh, three standard deviations from what would be considered the average extreme month in the summer and the winter. So we do already incorporate three sigma design, but with today's very high performance homes, such as a passive house design, uh, we start to find, and, and we'll show you uh, schematically why this is true, but we start to find that the design day now does not automatically include capacity that keeps people happy as far as their desire to move comfort conditions around. Take another example. The average human in the U.S. is five feet seven inches tall, but we design doorways six feet eight. And if you look at population statistics, physical characteristics, we find that six foot eight inch high doors will be three sigma design. Somehow we've iterated toward a height of a doorway that um, that would satisfy. 99.7% of the populace. And so we do design in certain ways for exceptional people. And, uh, and an important point is that while we can average human preference just the same as we can average weather, that there is no such thing as an average human. That there's nobody, essentially no one that is five foot seven inches tall. Half the population is taller than five feet seven and half is shorter than five feet seven. And just to give you a few examples, here's a January um, weather data, temperature and wind speed. And that red line shows the average temperature for January in central Illinois, about 22 degrees Fahrenheit. And this data is essentially an average January month, but is there one, two, or three times when we might have hit that average for a very brief instant? Otherwise, we're hotter or we're colder than that temperature. And average does not result in good modeling. It gets us part of the way there, but there's other things occurring within the dynamics of this. And wind speed uh, just as well. Uh, maybe the wind on average is five miles per hour, but if half the time it's 10 miles per hour and half the time it's zero miles per hour, the average infiltration through a house with half the time at zero mile per hour and half the time at 10 miles per hour is much, much different than using an average five mile per hour wind. Let's just look at it a little more schematically. Uh, Design a house with an average doorway. If only one person lives in that house or interacts with that house, you might think of, well, only half the uh, populace would be unhappy. And, uh, and you can see I've got a standard deviation of three Ps on my unhappy there. I'll correct that later. Um, so in this case, maybe only half the populace is unhappy. But let's take a look at you build four homes or you have a house uh, design that's going to have two people in it. Well, it's more than 50% that will be unhappy if you look at how you might scramble up the populace from people who are shorter than door height to people who are taller than door height. In this case, adding two people, now you got 75% chance that uh, you're going to have uh, callbacks. And uh, so three out of four homes there's probably going to be dissatisfied folks. And it doesn't take long, 
say, eight people who might be interacting with a doorway that's been designed at average, where you're going to be 99.7% sure of creating unhappiness. And it doesn't mean you have to build eight homes. It could be uh, four more people in the home. It could be friends coming over who happen to be taller than average, even if you are shorter than the average doorway height. But you're going to be assured that in some manner, you'll be getting some callbacks or some um, unhappy customers. So that's kind of the basis for seeing that even though 99.7 sounds like quite a large fraction of the populace that uh, to be covering with a design, that uh, it really doesn't take that many people in order for something that's less than that coverage over the uh, general uh, human populace that you're going to be seeing callbacks. Now, as far as ventilation and, and our preference for air quality, this plot just shows uh, some data. This is for 34 homes, uh, smart ventilated home, serve, uh, serve and serve to smart ventilation systems. And, uh, and it shows the set point. People are free to choose what level of air quality they want. You can see there's someone that sets their air quality at 600 parts per million of carbon dioxide and then equivalent volatile organic compounds. The uh, primary set point that people seem to gravitate to is about 1,000, which is what we send the serve out as a default. And we're looking at that now to just see if folks just aren't changing from our default or not. Um, in my house, which you can see online from our website, it's live data. Currently, I have my house at 650 just because I do want to run a higher ventilation rate during this day as we are trying to protect ourselves against um, uh, coronavirus infection. Normally, I run it at about 800, 850. Um, but you can see most people do tend to set it around 1,000 and then a few within this group of homes on either side of that. A bigger sampling uh, from serve and serve to data. This is from about 150 homes. And just looking at the set points that people have chosen, Again, the predominance of homes um, and since serves and serve twos, about 50% of them are online and about 50% uh, of the serve community uh, folks tend to uh, not keep it online or don't have internet access. And we find again, preferentially, a lot of people choose what's typically assumed to be average for human preference. And that's about a thousand parts per million of CO2 and associated VOCs. And, uh, and that anomaly is an airflow of about 20 cubic feet per minute per person. And when we, um, look at what the standard deviation of that preference is, we find that the average airflow preference is about 24 CFM per person, not too much different from what in ASHRAE ventilation standards, uh, the nominal 20 CFM per person turns out to be. But if we'd like to meet 99.7% of the populace preference, we would have a capability of hitting 50 cubic feet per minute per person. And that's what's displayed in this. You can see that there's not too many people out there, but we we are encouraging people to move out to higher airflow rates because we know definitely from the literature that we review that moving from 20 cubic feet per minute per person up to 40 cubic feet per minute per person in any occupied building will improve your productivity and it will reduce your chances of getting sick. If somebody who has a flu, a cold, or whatever type of illness happens to be sharing the same space. 
So um, let's talk a bit about comfort conditioning and this kind of hidden comfort conditioning capacity that we feel is necessary um, but hasn't really been realized to this point. And um, the basis for this is a set of field data we've taken from Vermont homes. We've done extensive energy, air quality, and comfort research with Vermont homes. Over a one to two year period, we collected hourly data, temperature, humidity, energy from uh, plug loads, energy from microwave ovens, from the serve unit, from heat pumps, uh, and um, as well as air quality, CO2 and VOCs. And within that data, we've seen that people are using their comfort conditioning system to heat up the home or to cool it down independent of what the outdoor temperature is. That is, there's just a desire by most people to have some level of comfort conditioning, even when outdoor conditions would say that, hey, it's pretty nice out there and there's not really a climatic load on the house. This plot shows a, a schematic of a car. Yesteryear's car had tons of horsepower. It took a couple hundred horsepower to drive like a 1962 Chrysler Imperial, which I used to own uh, at 70, 80 miles an hour on the highway. And because it had such an excessive amount of horsepower needed just to keep pushing along the road, at lower speeds, when you're accelerating from a light or from a stop, that horsepower was also sufficient for getting you up to speed in a reasonable amount of time. Today's cars, like a Tesla or today's electric vehicles, very streamlined, very lightweight, they only need 20 to 30 horsepower to cruise along at 60, 70 miles per hour. And if you only put 20 horsepower into that car, you would be very, very disappointed if you like to accelerate like most people up to road speed anytime you had to come to a stop. And this is why we find Tesla has 200, 300 horsepower uh, vehicles, even though they don't need much for, for going at low speed. We need to be able to accelerate. We want to get up to speed at a, within a reasonable period of time. And similarly in our homes, when we would like to change the temperature in the home, we would like to do that today, not two weeks from now. So let's look at some data for homes and see how we see this need, um, this desire for, for um, comfort conditioning when the climate isn't forcing uh, a certain capacity on us. Here are some predictions from our Zeros program for a Vermont home. And the blue solid dots are real data. This is the average of 13 identical homes with very non-identical people in them. These homes had one to five occupants, but the average occupancy, similar to average occupancy in the US, is about two and a half occupants. And, um, and you can see the details of all this data in a report that's located on our website. And then you can also get into zeros, and we hope you do. Uh, it's free to use software, and it's excellent software for doing design modeling, as well as economics and uh, financial modeling uh, for home design. But you can see that zeros does an excellent job predicting average Vermont home performance. But let's take a look at the daily energy that this collection of homes needed. So what was averaged into those blue solid dots looks like a shotgun hit it. Any particular temperature bin, 20 degrees Fahrenheit, 40 degrees Fahrenheit, you can see a lot of scatter. Activities that people undertake, one day cooking bread, another day doing laundry, another day not doing any of those things, perhaps just sitting quietly reading a book. And so if we average all this data, and if we then restricted people to a ceiling limit of average daily electrical energy use represented by those solid blue dots, 
we would have a lot of unhappy people. And if you look more detail at these dots, you would find that it's not that half of the people in these homes are always above average and half are lower than average. You'll find that on any given day, somebody who might be a below average energy user periodically would like to use more energy that day. And we feel very strongly they should. They should have the capability of being happy and use that energy. And uh, hopefully it's renewable energy and sustainably uh, sourced, but that we should have the capabilities for running this. If we take uh, that, say, at zero degree Fahrenheit, you can see that it's about 50 kilowatt hours per day. That would say that that house uses about, on average, two kilowatts of energy at zero degrees for both heating as well as kitchen and other, other activities. And if we were designing an electric panel that only allowed average electric use, we would only need a 10 amp circuit for 240 volts in order to give us that two kilowatt hour per day. But yet every home we put in more capacity capability than that. We put in 200 amps typically. And so we already account for people and, and their daily variations in energy usage. And we need to be able to do that for comfort conditioning as well. Uh, this plot shows correlations and interactions among different things. There's a lot of things that cause us to want to heat a house or to cool a house. And basically, among all of these items that are listed for a house, blue means that things positively correlate. So, for example, between the washer and dryer, that if you use a washer, that thick blue line means that most likely you're going to use a dryer. A red line indicates a negative correlation or if outdoor temperature, for example, when it's 60 or less, that T outside of 60 minus, as it gets colder and colder, you'll see that thick red line going over the heat pump air conditioner, that that is indicating a high correlation of the heat pump air conditioner, the mini split heat pumps, energy use, and colder and colder temperatures. In other words, temperature goes down, energy used by the heat pump uh, goes up. And, and then the thinner lines, as the lines get thinner and thinner, show some correlation, but less of a strong correlation. So for example, um, the percent relative humidity inside and the volatile, or, volatile organic compounds inside show no correlation. That is, you cannot use indoor humidity to correlate with either VOCs or CO2, even though some people are telling you that you might. Uh, you see that CO2 and VOCs are weakly correlated with these other things. You would think with human activity, such as kitchen use, that there might be correlation. But this data all comes from Vermont homes, which are all smart ventilated homes. And when you have a smart ventilated home that's keeping you at a set point, you break the correlation of poor air quality with human activity. Now, uh, so this is just kind of an interesting uh, plot that shows you some linkages, and I thought you might like to see that. This is some of the statistical studies that we do with data, and, and that's a very unique plot that I haven't seen before. Among these homes, they're very, very energy efficient. And as I mentioned, Vermont homes tend to be 20% uh, better in energy performance than the most stringent standards, passive house standards. But the way people use energy, some of these homes are dominated by comfort energy, seen in red bars. Some are dominated by uh, non-comfort. And uh, that is TV use, cooking, and things of that nature. But on average, over on uh, number 22, that bar, um, that that's the average use. And one of our definitions of a high performance home 
is when comfort energy and non-comfort energy are roughly in balance or that non-comfort energy is even outweighing the comfort energy. Uh, but you can see for any particular house is that uh, uh, one might outweigh the other. And for sure, there's uh, relevance between the two, as we saw in those correlations. Somebody that's cooking Thanksgiving dinner isn't going to need the heat pump for heating the house that day. And so, uh, so the heating and cooling loads are also going to be directly tied into the other activities and non-comfort activities of the home. Let's just look at uh, a couple of characteristics of temperature within these Vermont homes. And again, these are located in that Vermont report. On any given day, so this is daily data and uh, separated out by plotted against outdoor temperature. So in, um, four rooms are shown here. The kitchen living are kind of one open space and then a master bedroom and then a second bedroom for house number six. And we see that on average, this home, uh, the folks in this home would like it to be, say about 68, 70 degrees, where a lot of us set the temperature. They like to keep it at that through the winter and they're able to have whatever temperature they want. They have more than enough capacity in their heat pump in order to move them to a desired temperature. You can see that the unoccupied bedroom tends to be a bit cooler than, uh, than the other rooms. And then you can also see that going into summertime, it gets as hot as 90 degrees in the home. And, um, and basically, when we look at the energy from this home, during the winter wintertime, uh, this bottom is where it says access title, that should actually say outdoor temperature. So that's degrees Fahrenheit. But when this home gets below about uh, 50, 55 degrees, it starts heating, but it's actually uh, unoccupied with very little activity, very little daily electric energy use as we go up in temperature. And so the home's just floating, and it gives you an idea that even though the outdoor temperature in Vermont never got above uh, 80 degrees for uh, this year of data collection, that the indoor temperature got close to 90 degrees on some days. Now let's look at a temperature that was occupied all year. Similar temperatures indoors through the winter and then going into summer also maintained at the same temperature level. And, uh, and here you can see the second bedroom, the unoccupied bedroom in this home, it's at a lower temperature. Most likely they close the door and maybe close the uh, air vent to that room while maintaining more similar temperatures in the master bedroom and the living room, open living area. This house then actively did air condition during the summer and you can see the spread of daily energy plotted against outside temperature for this home and uh, you can see sometimes it's well above its average energy use and sometimes well below and that's just the characteristics of uh, of human living um, basically all of these homes these 13 homes we identified or we we monitored have that characteristic. Now, out of that scatter of electrical data, if we pull out the electric energy data for comfort control, and this is the energy going to the electric energy used for the heat pump, which is the dominant heating system and cooling system, and for the serve fresh air ventilation, because the serve in most homes spends most of its time in a recirculation mode. And during that time, it's using its heat pump, uh, its energy exchange heat pump for helping to contribute to comfort conditioning. And, uh, and so this is the electric energy of both the serve two and for the heat pump. Now the serve two is nominally about a third of a ton heat pump. And in each of these Vermont homes, they had uh, a Mitsubishi Hyperheat one ton uh, ductless unit installed. So with the daily 
electrical energy data, we need to go through the serve and the uh, Mr. Slim, the Hyperheat Mitsubishi one ton coefficient of performance or heat pump efficiency in order to determine what the comfort conditioning capacity is that accounts for the scatter of comfort conditioning capacity needed around the average comfort conditioning capacity. And, uh, and this plot shows the serve heating capacity, which as I mentioned is about nominally a third of a ton, but it varies with outdoor temperature. And, and then the coefficient of performance for the serve and the purple solid dots, which go to the coefficient of performance um, scale on the right. And then the open circle with the black line through it, which are field data um, or laboratory data by John uh, Winkler at NREL, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. You can see that the serve as well as the uh, Mitsubishi Hyperheat have very similar coefficient of performance trends. Both have very high performance compressors, very high performance heat exchangers. And so it's not surprising that their trends are also uh, somewhat similar, even though the serve capacity is about a third of that of the Mitsubishi. So um, over this temperature range, we can use this coefficient of performance to then back out what the average thermal conditioning capacity, both heating and cooling would be um, in these Ramad homes. And to look at the three sigma, the standard deviation from average conditioning capacity requirements that are needed just for this dynamic human preference. Now we don't know the reason why somebody will be using this additional energy of comfort conditioning capacity, but we can imagine why. Um, you've been exercising, you're warm, you'd maybe like it cooled down a few degrees in the home, you'd like to reduce the humidity, um, and so you lower the thermostat, and you should. Uh, you should do something that makes you more comfortable. Or you would like to sit quietly and read a book. And while your metabolism might be at a higher level that allows you to be comfortable with a lower temperature for whatever activities are going on, as you sit down and, and lower your metabolism, that you would maybe like to raise the house up a few degrees. And what we find from more detailed modeling, transient modeling of a building is that it roughly takes about a ton of heating or cooling capacity in order to move the mass of a house, which also has to accompany the change of the air temperature in the house, a few degrees within a few hours of time. And so as we look at this, the spread from the average comfort conditioning, which would be, say, the thermal forcing of the climate on the home, in summer or winter, that this one kilowatt of additional thermal heating or cooling, that figuring you would like that to have effect within so many hours of the day, that it takes about two to three kilowatts of heating or cooling capacity rather than this one kilowatt hour average heating or cooling capacity to to change a home by a few degrees uh, up or down. Uh, and that can happen in the winter time where you want to lower the temperature from what it's at or increase it from what it's at. And it happens just as often uh, when there's no climatic loading, when it's about 60 degrees in these uh, Vermont homes where on average very little heating or cooling capacity is needed. So I hope that that helps clarify why we feel all homes need at least uh, in the range of a ton of heating or cooling capacity, even though average design methods would point towards something 
on the order of a candle power for heating a home. If you want satisfied homeowners, because of the uh, interest in changing our comfort condition, regardless of what the outside climate is doing to the home, about a ton of capacity from our field data indicates that's what will give people the capability, the comfort that they would like. And in the case of people designing and building homes, fewer callbacks. Finally, just to kind of pique your interest, I hope, and maybe to have you scratch your heads a little bit, if one ton of capacity is good, what about two? It seems to be going in the opposite direction of what people are trying to get to as they talk about only needing a third of a ton or a quarter of a ton heating or cooling capacity. But as I mentioned um, at the beginning of this, two one-ton mini-split heat pumps operating at half capacity are more efficient than a single one-ton mini-split operating at full capacity. It's going in the opposite direction of the way people think, but this is actual data that we've collected in our lab. Uh, in this case, this is a one-ton Fujitsu ducted mini-split heat pump, but the same is true with ductless, and the same is true with different brands. And, um, and what you see in the blue dots is the coefficient of performance for this one ton mini split operating in low stage um, heating capacity. The same is true when it's operating in cooling capacity. And then the brown dots or orangish dots are when it's operating at higher heating capacity. Now the stage one or lower capacity um, is about half the capacity of the higher capacity but it happens with almost 30% higher efficiency. And the end result is that this means that two one-ton mini splits that are able to meet the load while staying in their stage one or lower stage heating or cooling capacity are going to give you 30% improvement in heating cooling efficiency. The scatter that you see on this, uh, we, we move this unit around in a lot of different ways, uh, affecting its airflow, affecting the temperature as well as the humidity going into it. So you're seeing a variety of conditions and you also see somewhat more sensitivity on the, on the higher stage coefficient of performance than you do with the lower stage operation for the same type of conditions. For example, if your ductwork is not very well installed or designed and you've got restricted airflow, the, the higher stage heating is uh, penalized more strongly because it starts hitting some high temperature limits as it's trying to put more capacity into that lowered airflow where the lower stage doesn't get penalized quite as significantly. We're going to be having more publications as well as more presentations on this. And we hope, uh, uh, watch for an uh, upcoming announcement. We're uh, very excited to be announcing uh, Mitsubishi uh, working with us on, on a couple of projects coming up in the near future. In any case, um, I hope that we've brought up a few ideas that help you think a little bit differently as far as ventilation needs in a home, as far as comfort conditioning needs and what will keep uh, home occupants happier in, in, uh, in a home. And, um, and that today's world with today's new technologies, things can be done differently. Smart ventilation gives you better and better air quality with less and less energy. Today's variable speed heat pumps, both in the serve 2 as well as in, uh, in today's mini split, as well as geothermal type heat pumps, give you exceptional performance at lower capacity ranges. And so I, I hope that uh, you'll look into this more and contact us for any questions that you might have. 
And finally, you know, uh, this day and age as we're going through something that I don't think anybody living has gone through for the most part, that we do have the tools and the science and the technologies for conquering the current coronavirus, but also for better preparing us for future uh, afflictions and challenges that may come our way. And a big part of that is getting us on a sustainable path, a more resilient way of living in our communities and in our homes. And so uh, with that, I hope there's words of encouragement as uh, as we go through this together. And thank you very much for, for participating. Bye-bye.